Kawabunga, what a time to be alive as a filmmaker. This is one of the craziest, most exciting years for cameras. So much so that I'm kind of breaking my silence to talking cameras and want to talk about all these new amazing cameras coming out and kind of some of the swings and misses this year. So if you want to jump ahead to when I start talking about those cameras, you can go to this point. But I wanted to give a little caveat here right off the top. I am not the most technical filmmaker. I know enough, but I like to rely on professionals. There's people like Gerald Undone who will give you all the dynamic range stuff that you need to hear about these cameras. But I want to talk more about their use on set. And the one thing I really want to give you before you go into this video is when it comes to cameras, it always feels like the grass is greener on the other side. But as the old adage goes, it's not greener water your own lawn. What I mean by that is it's not about the camera you're actually holding, it's what's in front of it. What are you shooting? We actually just took one of our films that we're developing, a TV series, and we took it to some amazing producers in New York, and now we're gonna be pitching it to some of the biggest streamers in the world. When they asked what camera we were using, we told them it was an FX6, shooting 422, 10-bit. There was nothing to do with RAW or any of that other fancy stuff, and they didn't care because they were excited about what Michael Del Monte, who's directing that series, had put together with our editor, Lewis Gordon, as well as Andreas Gonzalez from AOD. But let's talk about these cameras. Now let's first talk about the latest release, and that is the Canon C400. I've had the chance in the past to shoot on the C500 Mark II and a little bit on the C300 way back in the day, and they were great cameras, but recently it hasn't felt like Canon has had a really great competitor for the FX6. The C70 to me was a bit of a conundrum. I know a lot of people like my good friends from the Floberg team have crushed it on moving still with the C70, but still that Super 35 format to me is a bit perplexing, but I don't know, I'll die on this hill. My FX9 has full frame, I can crop into Super 35. So why start with Super 35? I love full frame 24 mil cropped to 235 at about an f-stop two. To me, that's one of my favorite cinematic images, wide and close. And to me, when I start shooting on the Super 35 format, I have to start getting really wide lenses. That said, the C400 now has full frame. And its price to me is what is most intriguing. Canon has jam-packed so many features, it doesn't leave much to be desired with this camera. You're talking 6K at 60 frames, the traditional 4K, I can't believe I'm saying traditional, but the 4K at 120 frames. And it has the internal raw light recording and all the dynamic range that you could expect. Canon is claiming 16 stops, but so does every camera manufacturer out there, I find true in real situation. It's always ends up being about a kind of an 11 and a half to 14 stop range that it actually feels like. Now caveat, I haven't used this camera yet, so I'm just making guesses based on what I've shot in the past with other Canon cameras. But having that internal ND, oh, that is a gift because I know everyone was always talking about the amazing additions of those ND adapters with the other Canon R series mirrorless cameras, which to me was just kind of goofy. I would rather have the ND built into the cameras. It's becoming kind of a standard across the industry. Even area has introduced it in the past years in their cameras. So shooting with cameras where you have to add additional ND to me is now kind of a thing of the past. But it's so great to see Canon really lean into this box cinema style camera shooting with triple base ISO. That's one thing that Sony has really been able to run ahead of so many people is clean high ISO, like the 12,800 on the FX6 and the FX3 is beautiful. It has a little bit of noise, but it's something that you can easily get rid of. I haven't shot with the 12,800 on Canon. I would be really interested to know what it looks like, but it's so great to see that Canon is now embracing this high ISO shooting. I'm finding on films I'm developing recently, it's been so helpful just to be able to hit that 12,800 at a quarter of ND and, and just keep shooting. For documentary especially, it keeps your work flow on set seamless. I, I, I tend to not work between native ISOs. When I shoot on my FX6, it's 800 or 12,800. I don't like to do the EI exposure index boosting. I just like to look at it as if it has two ASA ratings, as if it was a film camera. And this is great to see that Canon has that because I do find on the FX6 that jump between 800 and then suddenly 12,800 is just too much sometimes. So having that 3,200 in the middle that Canon has makes this one of the most ideal documentary cameras. And on top of that, they have also solved something right out of the gate that happens on so many cinema cameras, and that's the EVF placement. The little LCD screen is often when you put it on your shoulder, so close to your face. But Canon right out of the box has had this extension adapter. Well done, this is a camera to look out for. This is definitely a competitor. And what I like most about this as a Sony user is it's gonna really push Sony to make some improvements on the FX6 Mark II. <laughs> 
Next, we're going on to the second cheapest camera on this list, but it packs a powerful punch, and that's the Blackmagic Pixis camera. I've always kind of felt like Blackmagic has just underpriced their camera, their hardware, to get people into their ecosystem of software. So the prices on these, to me, are always so interesting because they're always so low. But it also kind of signals to me that I don't know if people are really adopting these cameras that often. I've used them in live video settings. I just don't see them that often on cinema sets. In the past, I've found the Blackmagic cameras due to the battery life and just kind of form factor haven't been something that I've wanted to use. But this is the first kind of Blackmagic box camera. I think it might be the first Blackmagic box camera, but the first one that I'm actually interested in using, especially because it's using the BPU battery system, which I'm quite often familiar with using my Sony cameras. My biggest thing out of the gate that I don't like about this is no HDMI. I, I typically use SDI, but there are times when I want to use smaller monitors or have just wireless adapter feeds, or in the case of my FX9 that I'm shooting on right now for my YouTube stuff, is I often will feed it into my computer for Zoom calls and I need that HDMI cable. So no HDMI in this is a small hit. It's not enough to get upset about it because most cinema monitors are SDI and SDI is more reliable with its locking mechanism, but Kind of a weird move by Blackmagic. I guess they just ran out of real estate on that camera. The Blackmagic also has its internal raw recording. They use their kind of uh, Blackmagic light. What's the mode called? Oh, it's a B-RAW? Yeah, it's B-RAW. You got a B-RAW, man. You embarrass me. No, the B-RAW on the Blackmagic is a cool format and allows you to get that extra dynamic range and pull back the highlights and the overblown windows, which to me is kind of the only time that I really care about RAW. I don't shoot RAW, but RAW for me for windows, when you're in interior is kind of the time that I really wish I would have RAW when you're trying to pull back some details in clouds, or skies, or windows. But for the most part, my opinion, RAW is overrated. What? Most of my films have not been shot on RAW you'll be fine with 422 for most of what you're doing. We even took our film Clear Sky to Nice Shoes in New York. That whole film was shot 422 10-bit and the colorist loved it. She said it was as nice as an Alexa camera and we never shot RAW, so don't worry about it. Especially you, Calvin. You can chill out about the RAW. For me as a Sony user, no native E-mount. Ugh, gotta use the EF lenses, which is fine. I've kind of moved away from EF lenses, not because I don't like them, but just because I'm in the Sony world now. I mostly shoot on Sigma lenses, I mostly shoot on iron glass, or as you know, I really do love all my vintage lenses that I'm buying off Etsy, off of people who are going through their garages and finding their grandfather's lenses. But it's not the worst thing. There's also a native PL adapter for the camera. Now, the confusing thing for me is no internal NDs, but I think Blackmagic is just really trying to focus on that price point to get people who that extra couple grand that it would cost to go up to an FX6 or the C400 are just gonna lean in on the Blackmagic camera. It's kind of strange, but you can always drop ND in front of your lens with a matte box or with a thread. I just would have liked to see Blackmagic do this so that it was a true competitor to the C400 and the FX6 kind of category. But then again, people are loving shooting on their FX3, like me and cameras like the FX30 also don't have internal ND. And I have a <laughs> external ND on this right here, case in point. God bless you Blackmagic users, you're so dedicated. You've really leaned into some very strange cameras in the past, but it looks like you finally have some decent battery life that doesn't need a V-mount. Very happy for you. Thank you, thank you. Next is a camera that has caused a lot of controversy for a fellow Canadian just down the road, and that's Gerald Undone, and it's none other than the Panasonic GH7. I have fond memories of these cameras. I used the GH4 for my first music video that I shot with Matty Hapoya years ago, and that was a fun camera, but man, was the low light terrible on it. And I gotta say, Micro Four Thirds is a psycho format. I know Gerald has retracted his statement about saying that it's dead, but to me, it is just bizarre. Let's not say it's dead because there's plenty of you still using it. But what's so frustrating for me is I love the 24 mil, like I said, on full frame. To me, that's one of the most cinematic looks ever. That style of shooting always draws me into a story. And in order to achieve that same look, you gotta go to a goofy 12 mil lens on the Panasonic. If you're shooting with a 24 mil on a micro four thirds, that's the equivalency of a 65 mil on full frame, which is wild. That's a very tight lens. So when it does come to the micro four thirds world, you're kind of committed to those lenses and it means a whole new investment. That said, the IBIS on the GH7 is insane. The tests I've been seeing people produce is incredible. And with that tiny body, it feels like you could get some really cool documentary moments because it's so light, you can run behind someone practically and it looks like it's on a gimbal. And there's some extra modes on that camera that allow you to get rid of that corner pinning wobble. My favorite thing about the GH7, and I wish Sony would do this, is ProRes RAW. That's awesome that that does it internally. 
I think just everyone's ready for litigation battles, it seems like. Although now that Nikon owns Red, it's gonna be some deep battles going on in court. But I think they can get away with that with ProRes RAW, although I know Sony couldn't do ProRes RAW because of patents, so I'm not sure what's going on there. But the GH7 for the price range is the cheapest on this list. It's just over $2,000. You know, if I, I, I can't promote, I, I don't feel good saying go shoot on four thirds just because it's just not something I do. And I don't want people getting committed to one set of lenses their whole life because you can't put a four thirds on anything else besides a four thirds. But if you want to live in that ecosystem, if you're a wedding shooter and you just, you're okay using it for that format because it is so light and so viable and it has that great now adapter for 32 bit float audio on top, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's kind of a great camera to buy at that price range. I, I can't say I can highly recommend it because I haven't used it, but so far it's looking pretty promising. Go try it out. Protein. Shake, break. It probably sounds disgusting. We should get some AMS, ASMR here. I'm one of those weirdos that drinks their protein shakes just with like warm water. That's probably like a quick indication if someone is mentally unwell. That and if they like four thirds. <laughs> okay, shout out to my mom for this Christmas gift, reminding me that I am a director. She's actually said that to me before. She goes, you're not a YouTuber, you're a director. Today, I'm a YouTuber. Now, if all the stats is coming at you and it's confusing you, we may built a PDF here that you can download in the description, which gives you kind of an overview of all these cameras and a few others, their price points, what they're offering. To me, the biggest realization this year is that Sony needs to lean in on an FX6 Mark II and introduce their, what is it called? It's a really weird name. The XOCN format, which stands for Extended Tonal Range Original Camera Negative. Man, Sony with like the XAVC eyes and all this, just the weirdest camera names. They just need to have a simple, catchy name. Like ProRes RAW is cool. There's also B-RAW that Blackmagic uses. Canon has Cinema Raw Light. What does Sony have? O X C N A V X A H D H D. All these crazy names. But if Sony does introduce that format, it's not technically a RAW, but it is a 16-bit. They have had it in the Burano, and it's to me one of the most interesting formats on the market right now because it is compressed, but it gives you all of the fidelity in the bit depth that you would expect from a RAW image. And if Sony can put this in, it can kind of silence the people or at least satisfy the guys and gals who really want to use RAW at its full capability. Like I've said, most of the time 422 is good for me. There are a few times when like blown out windows and skies I want to pull back. If Sony can build the XOCN into kind of their more affordable camera systems rather than just gatekeeping it in the Burano and in the Venice, that to me will actually change the whole landscape of the cameras. Of course, Sony, you can get the raw externally, but who wants to shoot externally? I, I don't want to have to shoot on a Ninja. I don't want one extra cable who going to an extra external recorder. I like to keep my systems as simple as possible. When I'm shooting documentary, I want to be thinking about my camera as little as possible. That's why I often haven't shot on red because it just, burns through batteries. There's a lot of extra gear I need to add to it. It's not as intuitive as a camera, in my opinion, at least for me, than using stuff like I've used in the past, like the C500s or the FX6 or the FX3 or my FX9. Those cameras to me lean into the documentary world a lot easier. And of course, those cameras are much easier to work with audio and audio is so important. Go watch my latest video about audio. I go on a big rant about this because I'm just finding people are really, it's kind of underwhelming the audio these days. <laughs> Back in the day, everyone's audio was good and their images were mediocre. And now it's kind of flipped around. Like it was, everyone's so cinematic and their audio is just mediocre at best. Last thing I'll reiterate is it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Case in point, we shot with an Alexa 35 and then also three FX6s and we mix them together and it looks fantastic. And if you have a great colorist, they can match those little tonal differences. I think the obsession over the gear and the technical aspects is an easy thing to do because it's less scary than actually thinking about your storytelling, your directing, or your editing. Those things are tough. To me right now, the camera world is kind of like a bunch of people standing around a car engine talking about the specs of the car and being afraid to actually go out and drive it and become a better driver. So get out there, get shooting. Don't worry about what camera you do or don't have. But honestly, some of these new cameras might be the things you want to invest into. Maybe you want to start thinking about selling some of your gear right now so you're ahead of the price dips for when those cameras actually hit the market. Very excited to see this. Very excited to see all these other manufacturers release these cameras because it's going to push these other camera companies looking at you, Sony, to start introducing things like internal RAW and just go to battle out here. I hate goodbyes, but I don't know. I, I, I was going to say I love Terry Black's barbecue, 
It was good. It was good. It was certainly not bad, but I don't know if it was the best barbecue I had in my life, but the whole experience was unique. Walking through there, yeah. It's good. What a great business. Go eat it if you're in Austin, but I'm in Canada. Also, does anyone know what movie this is? I don't. I just like the image. If you know it, leave it in the comments. Bye.